Chris. Next speaker is Mike Alexander. Uh, the dynasty continues because although I'm not related to Mike, uh, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> we did overlap when Mike was born on SCOMA in the 1980s, and Mike was born on SCOMA when Ben was doing his PhD. And uh, Mike is now going to tell us about conservation planning and uh, science in the future. If I can find uh, other Do you know where it is? Um, well, this is all a bit embarrassing, really, because uh, Ben and Chris have said everything I need to say. So I think I'll, I'll give up on that one. I, I've even got uh, one of my photographs of the water was taken on precisely the same rock uh, that uh, Chris has photographed Chew on. So <laughs> all a bit embarrassing. And uh, I will be using uh, much of the data that's already been uh, demonstrated. And I must begin by thanking uh, so many people for providing me so generously with data. So it will be a little bit repetitive, I'm afraid, but uh, now that I've seen that, as I've just talked beforehand, I might have uh, taken a slightly different approach. But my business is uh, nature conservation, uh, the practice of nature conservation, which we could argue is, is not a science, <coughs> but I think we could argue very strongly, very strongly, is entirely dependent on good science. And that's really what I want to talk about. But uh, just by way of introduction, I'm actually presenting this uh, really on behalf of the, uh, the Wildlife Trust. Um, I'm currently working with them to prepare a new and revised plan for Stormer Island. And uh, everything I've got to say really uh, is derived from my engagement with that plan. Uh, but I am employed uh, these days only part-time by uh, 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 NRW, um, so that needs to be mentioned. Um, and I do other things as well, but we won't go into that. Um, so really, uh, I, I want to illustrate this relationship between uh, science and nature conservation. And I guess I'd like to ask three questions. Can we monitor without planning? That might sound an odd one. It's not quite as odd as it may seem. Uh, is planning possible without monitoring? And uh, can we conserve wildlife without science? Uh, that's the kind of obvious one. Okay, we, we come to score, and oh my God, uh, we're faced with this, you know, this, this, this platter of, of, um, of, uh, uh, of designations, various designations. And from a, a, a conservation planner's perspective, it's a bit of a nightmare because there are so many obligations, most of them legal, that at the end of the day, you find you don't have too many choices. You, you end up recognizing the need to comply with the law, and particularly European law when it comes to these species. So all the species that we're highlighting today are members of either they either qualify individually or they're members of an assemblage of birds uh, which make up the Pembrokeshire uh, SPA. So we have a legal obligation to protect these birds or to maintain them favorable conservation status. Now, I, I don't want to talk too much about planning today, but I do want to make the point that it is an inclusive process. We just don't simply focus on the conservation features. We <coughs> take a much wider uh, perspective, and we look at uh, um, stakeholder, I hate that word. Uh, we look at uh, the interest that people show in these places, and uh, well, recently we, we use terms like ecosystem services, though in practice, uh, we've been uh, concerned, we've concerned ourselves with ecosystem services for rather a long time. It's not, uh, it's not anything new, although it's got a new label. Um, and planning has got a bad press. People sort of imagine uh, people are these scribbling away in a corner somewhere, uh, producing dull, dusty tomes that sit on shelves, gathering dust, and uh, wise people will say, well, you'd be better off doing some conservation than uh, scribbling away in a corner. Well, planning, as far as I'm concerned, is not about scribbling away in the corner. Planning is uh, an integral component of conservation management. In a sense, it's the intellectual thinking part of, of conservation management. And it should be, not always, but it should be a continuous, uh, cyclical, iterative, and developmental process. It's constantly moving ahead. It's constantly responding uh, to the requirements of our natural world and the pressures that we put on it, uh, our expertise, and so on. Press the wrong button, not that that doesn't matter because I'll press the right button. Um, the approach we use and have been using for quite a long time, specifically on the national nature reserves, uh, is adaptive, adaptive planning management. This again has more recently become rather popular in Britain. It's been around for a very long time. 
the first uh, publication was in 78 with Hollins, uh, several thousand papers, virtually all of them from the Americas or Australia or New Zealand. Uh, I think I'm one of the very few people that's published on conductive in, 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 in Britain. There are a couple of others. Uh, but suddenly, with the uh, Welsh Government's um, uh, adoption of the ecosystem approach, uh, adaptive planning is central to that. It's, it's, it's implicit within the whole of the ecosystem approach. So what are the characteristics of this planning approach we use? Well, this is the most important one of all, clear and specific objectives. We must know what it is that we're trying to achieve. Without that, we're going nowhere. Monitoring with a feedback link is essential. This is all obvious stuff. Learning is an explicit objective. That is, it's a process of managing through learning. Management is not delayed by uncertainty because some of the issues that have been highlighted this morning already, uh, we're uncertain. We don't know. We're asking questions. We don't always have the answers. And of course, adaptation is necessary. In other words, we can never have confidence that what we're doing is the right thing or whether it's appropriate, whether it's going to protect species or otherwise. And this is more or less what it looks like, a rather simple cycle. And there are dozens of different versions of this. This is one that's developed by the CMS uh, consortium. Um, pretty obvious stuff, so I'm not going to bother you with it. But let's go back to what I said. The key point, the most important thing of all, is that we're able to express objectives. And I'm sure you've all come across this stuff, smart uh, objectives. And I want to focus on that thing particularly, which is measurable. Uh, our objectives must be measurable. So where does that come from? Well, I first want to turn to the legislation. I want to turn to uh, European legislation, uh, the, 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 the uh, Natura 2000, and in particular uh, the Birds Directive. And it places quite obscurely and vaguely an obligation on us, sorry, the interpret obligation to obtain favorable conservation status. But that, in a sense, is a pan-European concept. In other words, it is our responsibility within Europe as a whole to obtain favorable conservation status for these species. But logically, if you're not obtaining favorable status on the key sites, then how on earth can you obtain favorable status over the whole of Europe? So the, the old agencies have decided that it makes an awful lot of sense to apply this at a local level. Um, it's, it's, it's common sense, you'll see in a second that it is common sense. Um, but the way we interpret it, of course, is that we have a legal obligation to protect these species on these sites. A legal obligation. We can't set that aside. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, we must ensure the size of the population is maintained or increasing, which is kind of obvious. Uh, it must be sustainable in the long term, that's a difficult one, because how on earth do you determine whether something's sustainable or not? Well, there are things that we can look at. And we must be pretty certain that the range is okay, that it's not contracting, and that sufficient habitat must exist uh, to support the population in the long term. So this is all common sense, it's really sound stuff. Uh, anybody who's engaged with conservation would recognize the validity of these statements, but as you can see, it comes from Article 1 of the Habitat Directive. Now, the, let's focus on these two, because they're easy for me, uh, range uh, and sufficient habitat. And we've heard from Ben, highlighted by Chris, the issues of trying to deal with seabirds, and I make no apology for using the same information. Uh, Tim uh, <laughs> uh, shared this with me, and obviously Chris had the same stuff. Um, 2008, Tim was telling us, well, this is where uh, the birds, uh, this is the area of sea that they utilize when they're incubating and when they're feeding. And then by 2012, he was saying something a lot more exciting because he was able to add to that uh, by taking, uh, as he puts it in, in, his, uh, in his slide, multi-sensor, using multi-sensor tracking. And Chris, as Chris explained, we now know what the birds are doing well in places so we can identify the foraging areas critical foraging areas that we need to know about to protect these birds. And then, of course, uh, Chris uh, showed you this and explained it to you. I don't need to say anything about it. But it does give us a particular spec perspective on what we call a Welsh seabird. And what this does, this simple bit of evidence, just from uh, one essential piece of research, one exciting piece of research, it, it, it highlights our limitations. And we all talk about the ecosystem approach without really understanding what an ecosystem means. And certainly an ecosystem from the perspective of the shear water was amply demonstrated by the side that I've shown you. It doesn't recognize our boundaries. It doesn't recognize 
that Wales exists as a, as a, as a place. Their islands are simply places where they lay eggs and raise their young. Their real life is at sea, it is elsewhere. So, uh, what we have to understand is the best that we can ever achieve on the Pembroke Crowns is to make a contribution to favor conservation status. We'd be extremely arrogant if we thought that we could do more than that. But we've got to do the best uh, of all that in those areas where we have some influence. That's the rock that Tris found in the Gap of Earth, although, in case you're wondering. Um, so, first rule of objectives, they must be quantified and measurable. If they're not, then they have no use to us at all. We've developed over the years the, the concept of attributes, where an attribute, you can read it yourself or I'll read it for you, is simply a characteristic of a feature that can be monitored to provide evidence about the condition of that feature. Obvious stuff. We need a focus for our monitoring. If we look at species, well, I've already covered except in distribution, so I'm not going there again. Size of population has been mentioned. Um, we can count birds uh, with varying degrees of accuracy. Uh, Chris claimed that Tim was uh, uh, Tim was had quite an easy life because the gillies are easy to count, and other things that the in are not. But in addition to that, and we heard specifically from Ben um, the uh, few of the other attributes I've got in here, which is survival, race, productivity, age structure, and so on. These are attributes. These are things that are tangible, things that we can measure things that we can use to determine how these species or populations are doing. So let me turn to uh, guillemots uh, very briefly. Uh, we use attributes with what we call specified limits, in other words, we quantify them. So total guillemot population, pretty obvious stuff. Where does that uh, 21,600 come from? It comes from research. It comes from years and years and years of research since the 1960s. Annual survival rate of breeding adults, three in any five consecutive years with survival rate of less than 85%. Tell Tim told me that that's correct. He checked it, uh, so did his students. Uh, so without the academic input on these islands, we would not be able to quantify that attribute. Indeed, we'd have difficulty identifying that attribute. And if we turn to uh, productivity, then the story is exactly the same. The values come from science with science. Let's uh, move away from birdies, let's have a look at something else. A quick uh, pop into the world of seals. And of course, it's exactly the same. We use the same process. Uh, with seals, we don't even bother with total population, because we can't. Uh, they're a mobile population. We've got no way of understanding how many adults we have in an area. But we can look at the total number of pups that they breed as an attribute, and we can look at the survival rate. And all of this is measured. Now again, our ability to identify attributes comes from the experience that we've had over so many years. Um, going around the cycle, the adaptive cycle, we come to monitoring. And as I said, uh, it is critical. It is an integral component of the adaptive management process. So I'm going to uh, uh, use a definition of monitoring. I don't want to hijack the word. We use monitoring in lots of different ways. But I specifically want to use the JNCC definition uh, it's surveillance undertaken to ensure that formulated standards, try and remember that the formulated standards, which are in fact our objectives, are being maintained. So it's not simply going out and catching a few birds willy nilly. We need to know when we count them whether the results indicate uh, favourable or unfavourable. This is critically important stuff. So we back now to Tim's work, and we have, this is not Tim's work, sorry, this is work carried out by the Trust. We can see clearly that uh, at the moment it looks good, but I think you'll discover that Tim has something quite different to say about this. We mustn't be misled by a, a, a relatively uh, short-term uh, change in a population. Tim will talk, take a wide perspective. And here we are. This now is the real data coming in. But the critical point, of course, is that this data, <coughs> these data, are being uh, generated by research work. In other words, people continue people carrying out the research are providing NRW with the fundamental information that they require to report on the status of these seal pups. Uh, again, we'll have a quick peep at the seal pups, and again, you can see the run of data, highly informative. It allows us with confidence to say, these seals are probably okay. We're doing a good job. This is a success story. In effect, what we're doing here is testing uh, legislation. Uh, way back, uh, 
legislation was brought in to protect seals, our whole attitude to seals has changed, and we can demonstrate that it will as well. Now, I want to look at factors. Now, Ben uh, did this for me. I, I really don't need to cover this bit, but uh, there's no harm in a bit of uh, revision. So we know what factors are. Anything that's going to impact on the population. Of course, some can be positive, they're not all negative. Uh, and they can be uh, anthropogenic, the consequence of things we do, uh, or they can be natural. So I come back now to favorable conservation status and this business of sustainability in the long term. The only way that we will ever have any indication of sustainability is by understanding or trying to make sure that the significant factors are under control. And it's been made clear to us this morning that we don't understand some of these factors. We, we really have a, 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 a tough job. Uh, ben had a better photograph of a rat than mine, and I quite like his cute little pussy, but uh, we won't talk about that. Um, the nice thing, of course, about the number of crowns is that they are predator-free, uh, and we intend keeping them that way. But it, 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 it's, it's an expensive task in itself. You know, it's not something that, that's achieved lightly. Um, the, the Trust have been managing SCOMA since 1960, and you know this is quite wonderful. They can put quite generally their hands on their hearts and say, we have accommodated thousands and thousands and thousands of people on this island, and there is no detectable impact whatever on these key seabird populations. What a wonderful thing to be able to say from any uh, perspective. Uh, so uh, managing people, the secret of course is that if you let people have willing any access to SCOMA, people often criticize uh, uh, the restriction, but those restrictions are essential. It is the management, the careful management of people <coughs> the island that has uh, helped us deal with this factor, because yeah, visitors are a factor, they can be extremely negative. We are blessed with a nature reserve, I hope to goodness we can say that in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years time. It is the level of control the land, the seas of SCOMA, that greatly contributes to our ability to protect the vulnerable seabirds that nest on the island. We mustn't forget that. Now, sticking with factors, uh, Ben dealt with this. I know Tim's going to talk about it a little bit later on. It happened. Now, I don't know if any of you have read the IPCC report. I waded through it on, on Monday night. I was having one of my uh, sleepless periods. Um, it doesn't make good reading. Uh, the, the most awful thing I feel is that they're moving uh, from uh, 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 mitigation to what they call adaptation. Um, adult, uh, and humans can adapt. I wonder if giving lots of puffins can adapt uh, fast enough in time. They do make the point that there are in many periods of uh, quite uh, rapid environmental change with consequential extinctions. And they point to the fact that what we see now is more rapid than anything that's happened in the past. So things are happening, things are not clever. Um, we can argue all day about whether we believe this is natural or otherwise. It is a factor, it is an event, it is something that has, we believe, the most atrocious impact on these populations. Uh, ben mentioned oil pollution. Yeah, like him, I think he said four, Ben. Uh, I can claim six, uh, seven, if I don't, one didn't go to school. Um, what can we say? It's there, it hasn't gone away hasn't gone away. And when we have these massive wrecks, when we have huge pressures on populations, this is when we've got to look at some of these other factors and make sure that somehow or other they're under control. And I make no apologies for showing that seal. You know, I watched it die, and I'm sharing it with you. you know, this is what oil pollution actually does. But tankers, and I think, Phil, you'll probably tell me that's a gas thing, and not, a, not a, an oil tanker. I don't know, it's a tanker, it's off north here in Skoma. Now, Marine Reserve, uh, bless their hearts, have been collecting data on tankers for quite a long time, and we have gradually become aware that the numbers of tankers mooring in St. Bride's Bay, in this critical area, is increasing and increasing and increasing. Um, sometimes it's like, uh, it's, it's like Blackpool out there with all the lights and the clanging and the clanking and the noise. Um, this again, thanks to the MNR for the wonderful work. Um, this is the distribution, the position of tankers in just 2013. And then when I pop quickly to work carried out by Ben Dean, you can see that this coincides more or less exactly with those areas that are utilized by shearwaters both before they come onto the island and before they leave the island. So there's a coincidence there. And this has led to, uh, it's the evidence that was used to determine whether we should 
uh, increase uh, or propose an extension of the marine SPA or otherwise. You can see the data there show quite well. This is taken from the SPA document, the, the proposal that's been made. But I, I want to emphasize that this is only about shear waters. Uh, this extension isn't going to do anything for giving moss puffins, giving uh, gulls or anything else. It's just about shear waters. And we might uh, believe um, uh, if, we, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we think from the heart that there is going to be problems with great big tankers, clanking lights and everything, the birds are not nocturnal sitting in the same areas. We don't know that for certain. But it's a fact that an, an attempt is being made to bring it under control. It's, we've only identified the fact that because of research uh, on the island and recording in the marine reserve, and hopefully uh, this might have an impact, though without bylaws it won't do very much at all. Uh, so coming back to the questions I asked at the beginning, there's no planning, uh, no monitoring. Well, that should be obvious now. The planning process identifies the formulated standards. Okay? It is the planning process that identifies the formulated standards. Without formulated standards, we are conducting surveillance or we're surveying, but we're not monitoring. So the dependence, I think, is kind of obvious. No monitoring, no planning. Well, I, I hope again this one is 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 has become obvious because adaptive planning is entirely dependent on our ability to monitor conservation features. If we can't do it, we're not going anywhere. Uh, it allows us uh, to assess all conservation management activities. So the activity, conservation management activity extending the SBA boundary, that can only be assessed in the future through monitoring. But it's the same with all of the factors that I've been uh, outlining. We can't come to terms, we can't do all these things uh, unless we are monitoring. And the monitoring must be focused in two ways. Uh, it must always be focused on the feature, the species, the population that we're concerned about. Must focus. The only measure of life is the measure of life itself. The surrogates don't work. And by the way, you can't monitor a population of, say, puffins or razorbills and extrapolate and assume the same thing is happening to give them up. It doesn't work that way, I'm afraid. We have to focus, and this is why in the, the definition of an objective, we talk about specific. Specific in that context means that we're talking specifically to the feature that's important. And critically, uh, monitoring allows us to identify the status of the feature. Status is simply the difference between what we know we want and what we've got. It can either be favorable or unfavorable. And that, of course, allows us to demonstrate uh, as a nation that we are accountable within Europe for uh, protecting uh, these species. And of course, it facilitates the statutory obligation. Without monitoring, we cannot uh, report with any confidence, or we should not report with any confidence. Uh, and so, no science, no conservation planning, well, I've kind of covered that up tonight. It is science alone that provides us with the ability to define quantified objectives. But the long-term population studies provide the evidence that we need to quantify the attributes. I've illustrated that. And the long-term population studies are, in fact, monitoring. They, they're fulfilling a dual purpose. They are meeting a statutory obligation to collect this information. I was going to finish with a couple of pretty pictures, because I like pictures, uh, I like these birds, but um, last week I went to Pembrokeshire. Uh, I need to do this from time to time. Uh, and I went to a walk the coast, and one of my favorite places, Freshwater West. Now, you can read reports, you can see things on television. Um, by the way, my whole life is sort of centered around islands and seabirds and things like this. So, Forgive me for being a tiny bit emotional. I, I, I refuse to set it aside. And we are not to the beach and the strand line. Suddenly you see these black and white objects in the strand line. You look close and it's a bird. And then you walk along the strand line. And somebody's collected in a little heap. Kitty wick in there. Puffing in there. And there's more of them. Like every metre. Along that strand line, it's dead birds. Every metre. What does this mean? What does it mean? And of course, what questions go through our minds? Um, which of the birds is the breeding population that's been affected? What core part of the population has been affected? And then you ask a pretty obvious question, but it's an important question. Has adult survival been affected by this wreck? And I leave that question open. 
because at the moment it won't be absolute. Thank you very much. Mike, we've got time for one or two quick questions. Not so much attention, it's more a comment. You know, we're, we're doing all this monitoring and, and what's a lot of at the moment, but numbers, we did success. Uh, Geolocator started to see where we're going, but probably one thing that we're not doing is actually dedicated beach park surveys that the RSDB used to um, do 10, 20 years ago. Maybe something that needs to come back into the game. I think it's a strong argument to doing it. I was actually quite disturbed to see that the birds hadn't been collected and removed and, and counted. But then, you know, there's so much pressure on people. That, 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 um, there are very limited resources available. Resources should be made available. We should be able to respond to crises. And uh, by any uh, uh, measurement, this seabird wreck is one hell of a crisis as far as these uh, seabirds are concerned. We don't seem to have the ability to just suddenly respond. I remember the Oncress oil spill. I remember when the oil spill happened, at that time I was able to bring together every single uh, member of the field staff in Wales that had sea boating experience. We brought them down to Pembroke and we spent the whole time doing our best uh, to work on the spill. Uh, we need to go back to that sort of uh, uh, way of working. Okay, well, no, no. Uh, I'd first just like to underline a few of your slides about the, uh, the sort of impact of invasive species. I think we need to really raise that, that profile because, you know, at the minute, these seabird islands are absolutely amazing, but we've seen what happens if we actually get onto these islands, they can absolutely devastate and all this lot be. Uh, what I would say there, of course, is the Trust uh, developed a pretty impressive protocol for controlling invasion on the islands. And we extend that, I hope, now to uh, plants as well. You know, the, the, you can't take this to these places. It may have been the case in the past that people were quite relaxed about it. I know certainly when I was at war, I thought there were all sorts of things that shut down. But we've, we've grown up, we've learned a little bit. <laughs>